Dusty has taken some new breakthroughs in mathematics and applied them to helping companies make sense of vast amounts of information. And at the same time, um, Dr. Singh has been serving on the Tech Advisory Board of HSBC. So great to have, have him here. And uh, next we've got um, uh, Roy Teo, Director of the fin uh, FinTech and Innovation Group at the Monetary Authority of Singapore who uh, has over 20 years in the public and private sector, working in um, risk management, audit, compliance, regulation, so really a broad base of uh, experience there. And uh, his team has been working on a lot of initiatives to make uh, Singapore a go-to place for new financial innovation. So really excited to, to hear how that's shaping up and evolving. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Ashwin Raj, um, a financial industry veteran, who is at Visa designing and pushing many of the mobile standards in payments and, and sort of direct payments and things like that that we're actually seeing come to fruition today. Um, so we'll be really excited to, to get his perspective on what's going to come down the pipeline next. Um, Ashwin was running uh, payments at Amazon and, and helped uh, drive tremendous growth in the business there. And just recently, like uh, this week, uh, took a new role running uh, payments fraud and a bunch of other stuff at Lyft. So, very excited to have all of them, and if you could, uh, we'll just dive right into it, I guess. You've uh, certainly been in the financial industry a uh, tremendous amount of time and seen, you know, some of these ideas go from hypothetical concepts to, to an actual reality. Um, so I'm excited to understand from you, what are some of the unique trends that you're seeing now that we should really be paying attention to behind sort of the noise and, and all the hype, and you know, what's, what's really changing, you think? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Alok. Everybody hear me? OK. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. It's a pleasure to be here always. And uh, uh, looking forward to this uh, great discussion and uh, to my distinguished panelists uh, uh, sitting with me. Um, so for me, you know, as you pointed out, uh, the whole um, aspect of innovation, trends, et cetera, one of the big realizations that uh, I have learned over the years is that there's a long gestation period and there is a, a consumer adoption life cycle that comes with it. So what we were thinking about in 2003, 2005 in, those, in that time frame is only now starting to become mainstream. And uh, what has always attracted me in my career is that the ability to see to some degree what could potentially be a, a trend in the future. And I have you know, in my career moved a little bit from fintech to utilizing fintech for companies like Amazon and now uh, Lyft. So I'll probably start with a few high level um, trends and give some examples related to it and then we can deep dive uh, subsequently in the discussion. So the one that I have now started consistently seeing, uh, especially with payments, with, uh, you know, associated fraud and other things, but also the utilization of the consumer experience is the coming together of identity and the personalization aspect of that customer experience. And that's going to become critical. If you think about it, uh, today a consumer is known only by a certain set of factors. For a payment uh, company, they're known only by the card. The card, that 16-digit number is your identifier. They do not know who you are as a person and what your preferences are and what your uh, likes are to be able to customize and personalize that experience and offer to you what you want to either buy or consume uh, or you know, watch a show, they don't know that and they're flying blind. And, uh, and that's something that I see will consistently gain um, steam and continue to evolve. Uh, Amazon is trying to solve it, you know, companies like Uber, Lyft, Facebook, everybody is trying to solve it and bring all those pieces together. Uh, the second piece is the removal of friction in the customer experience. And today, every aspect, we put so many steps because of, you know, I don't want to pick on my colleague here, but, you know, regulations is one requirement. But then there are several other requirements that are imposed by businesses, policy, uh, et cetera. And the removal of that friction is, is critical. I, I draw an example where... Uh, you know, I'll talk about uh, Alexa as a device. And in that example, uh, or Google Home, the whole point of it is to remove the friction in the customer experience. So uh, Amazon has developed it in a way where you could, you know, order your detergent. Uh, you know, Alexa, order my detergent. And she'll be like, can I reorder it? 
done, right? Why would you need to go into a website, put a search term, find the detergent you want, look at prices? Because you know that's the only detergents you're going to buy. You're not going to change detergents every month. You are used to a certain type of detergent. So it's removal of that friction, and especially for companies like Lyft and so on, that becomes even more critical. Uh, the third piece on the Alexa trend itself, I think voice technologies are going to become more mainstream going forward. Mm -hmm. You can see a tremendous amount of investment by all the big, uh, you know, the fangs of the world, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, tremendous amount of investment. And so voice-based interactions, especially as it come, become, comes to financial services, is going to become critical. Again, if you're talking about a banking transaction, you know, why would you want to go and do certain set of things? Yes, you need to be validated. This is where the identity now ties in. But if you know, if Alexa is able to recognize you through voice recognition as to who you are, and you say, hey, transfer money from my account A to account B, or transfer money to my friend, and the identity behind it will now enable that transaction. The fourth piece is, for me, the machine uh, learning and processing on the cloud. And we have an expert here, so I'm not going to get too much into detail. But that's becoming a significant aspect and a, and a core source of strength. Be it fraud or risk processing, or be it something like Amazon Go. I don't know how many of you know about Amazon Go, but if you, it's a store where you can walk in, pick up anything, and walk out. The device and your identity on the device is recognized when you walk into the store, and that's it. There is no interaction. You can pick up anything and put it back, and you just walk out. It's an experiment. It's only in Seattle right now. But that's the future. That's, and there's a whole bunch of scanning and photography and, and recognition and processing that's happening in the cloud that's allowing that to, to be enabled. The next piece, which is really what attracted me to Lyft, is I feel that the future is autonomous vehicles and, uh, and the evolution of it. Again, massive amounts of investment. Everybody from Tesla, GM, Google, all investing in it. And if you think about autonomous vehicles, don't think about autonomous vehicles in terms of, I want to get, go from point A to point B. Autonomous ve vehicles are going to change our lives. And in that, if you think about Autonomous vehicles, you won't own a car. You will only subscribe to a certain number of rides. Why do you need to own a car? The car shows up in the morning, takes you to work. You're done. But even beyond that, think about how it will transform retail, how it will transform banking. Today, how do, you, how do you withdraw cash? Anybody? Sorry? I, th I think I heard we, we don't, or... <laughs> okay, but if you need to, how <laughs> do you Maybe the way cash? of the future already here, or... <laughs> you need to go to an ATM, right? Yeah. Because you are not the typical population. There's a whole bunch of people who still handle cash. And how do they withdraw? They go to an ATM. But if you think about an autonomous vehicle, that ATM can come to you. Think about a retail store with a certain set of products which can now travel. That's the future that autonomous vehicles bring. Lastly, and this is a little bit more uh, interesting, but I think this is something that, you know, as people start businesses and uh, businesses grow, uh, this is a broader, more political, macro trend. Uh, if there is a whole um, change that's happening where there is a, a trend towards pro-localization, meaning that businesses need to be in market creating jobs and creating uh, more opportunities within the market. And if you're a startup or if you're a business thinking about it, that's something that you cannot ignore. And business today is ignoring that. And everybody is putting their heads in the sand and not mm -hmm. considering it. But all trends in all markets, anywhere in the world, be it developed, developing, doesn't matter. But that's a trend. And that's going to have repercussions on everybody establish new businesses and so on. So that's something that we need to think about and manage to, that will change, but I think that's uh, pretty important. Yeah, those are all really great points. Um, I'm quick aside to the audience, how many people work in the financial industry or are somewhat affiliated with it, just to get a gauge for our panelists? Okay, very interesting. Um, and how many people are interested in maybe starting something new or working in on something new or disruptive in the next like year? 
a sense. Okay, great. A healthy handful of all of you. So, um, Roy, I mean, coming to you next, I mean, we've got folks like Ashwin that are constantly prodding the envelope, trying to trying to push back on regulation, no, or, or work within it. But, um, you know, from the, the international perspective that you've certainly got, um, you know, looking at Asia, and also in terms of where you're focused, um, what are some of the areas where you see um, people pushing the boundaries in financial services today? Where, where's the action at? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Roy from MES. Just a quick thing about MES. We are the central bank. We are the regulator. We are also the market developer. And this is one big reason why we are here looking at how we can develop the fintech ecosystem in Singapore. It's a um, it's very interesting stage right now for Asia, for ASEAN, and for Singapore. And um, if you need to know more, come by the booth and I'll tell you a lot more. But um, just going back to the question, really, if, if, you, if we look at about two to three years ago, I think there is a very famous um, JPEG that was floating around in the internet or within the community is the unbundling of financial services in Wells Fargo. I'm sure um, quite a lot of you would have seen that. Um, but the narrative of um, somebody eating my lunch in the financial services have sort of changed. Right now, you probably will hear a lot more about startups, fintech startups, um, working with um, financial institutions, and they are now cooking dinner together rather than eating each other's lunches. Um, so that's um, the, the change in narrative from two to three years ago to right now. And, and we see that quite a fair bit. And, and going back to even talking about fintech, there, there is that... Um, idea of fintech equals payments equals lending. Um, this is something that we don't see that um, happening. I mean, if you look at if you look at that definition, that is a very very narrow definition. At MES, we look at um, fintech um, in a much broader sense, looking at um, retail banking, looking at corporate banking, look at insurance, look at asset managers, um, wealth management, etc. So it's a wide range of um, solutions for our financial institutions and where the potential is, it's maybe the B2C type, um, it's sexy in, in a bigger way, it's good for a big domestic market, but if you want to go global, um, B2B is to, the way to go, and, and we see that moving quite a fair bit, um, moving from B2C to B2B to B, B2B to C. Um, and, and that's important because um, in order for you to expand, um, looking at domestic market can't be the solution. So this is why uh, I think in, in Singapore what we have done so far is really to see how we can help our community reach um, global. So we, we have a tagline, think, think um, work local but think global. So we start off um, in, in Singapore and then we see how we can help the company expand globally. So I think when we look at um, trends in financial services, you brought up a point um, which is very important in, um, in fact, in, in any regulated entity is the know your customer portion, which is very, very difficult. In fact, the previous panel spoke about that as well. Once you touch on financial services, one important aspect is know your customer. And if you have been following news in, in the Asia market, um, you would have heard that just two days ago, we, we, there is a big announcement that Singapore created an infrastructure called MyInfo. Um, MyInfo consists of verified information by the government of Singapore, and therefore the financial services and the startups are able to tap into such a service, um, get verified information, and roll out their services helping them to reduce that friction in terms of KYC, in terms of regulation. So that is a big step. And this is how we look at um, the trend going on. There is an infrastructure piece that needs to be provided by the public sector. And then there is that um, added value-added services that will be provided by the private sector, including the startup community as well as our financial institutions. So working together with the community, I think that's, that's the change um, in the narrative what, from what we saw two to three years ago to, to right now. And, and that is a big, big step forward because um, coming together, we realize that they produce a lot more. And uh, a comment earlier about a thousand POC kill, uh, uh, killed by a thousand POC, and that's exactly what we felt that it shouldn't be the case. And we, in Singapore, we, we have a few rules. If you're doing POC, make sure that you get paid 
and make sure that banks wanting to do POC with you, they pay you well. And the very important thing in Singapore we always talk about is food, and we feed our fintech companies very well. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's that's true because if you're well fed, you get very good solutions. That's awesome, um, uh, Gurjeet. Just, uh, I mean, I certainly, if you follow any headlines today, you know. AI machine learning makes makes a, a, a fair number of them, and it's kind of you know with a with a Yazdi serving a lot of financial companies. I'm I'm curious what you're seeing practically today in terms of where is AI changing AI or applied machine learning changing their businesses, and and what kinds of areas you think are somewhat on the cusp today where we're going to see some maybe bigger changes going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, in terms of uh, AI and machine learning, you know, we we work with a lot of the largest financial services institutions in the world, and it is absolutely a huge agenda item on on everybody's radar, right? Um, and in some sense, the the Uber point to think about is, you know, when you think about what do banks actually do, they basically provide by default private messaging, right? Mm -hmm. But the messages are accompanied with money. Right? That's what you pay a bank for, that you, know, you have encrypted, privatized exchange of information between parties. And if you think about, um, if you think about the bank as an information processor, then you, know, you, don't, you don't really need the hundreds of thousands of people that go work at a bank. So in some sense, the opportunity to make the system more efficient is, is a big opportunity everybody is looking at. Right? Now, in terms of the problems that are at the cusp, I mean, there are, there are a few obvious ones, like you know, things like fraud, sort of the unregulated things in some sense. You know, financial services insurance have done for about 50 years now, right? Fraud models, risk modeling, things like that. Right? These, are, these are unregulated crown jewels of a bank that you know, they've had for, for a long time now. Um, but as, as anybody who's spent any time in this ecosystem knows, you know, the vast majority of data in a bank is quote unquote unlabeled, right? It's information that's siloed, that's sitting in multiple different databases. In fact, one of the things I love saying is, you know, the big problem in big data is big people, right? And so there's sort of a huge opportunity to integrate all of that data. And the unregulated pieces of that, such as, uh, you know, fraud modeling and so on, will have great solutions. But then there's sort of regulated parts of the market, for example, you know, risk modeling for things like IFRS 9 or PPNR, uh, where you know, the regulators impose pretty large restrictions. And by the way, I love regulators. You guys are awesome. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. Uh, where you know, we are still sort of developing, hand developing models, handwriting economic hypotheses, and saying, hey, this is what I believe will happen to the economy, which stand to be automated to a large degree with a lot of rigor. Right? And again, it's a combination. It's not just a pure predictive problem. It's a problem where you have to take into account a lot of factors that may be unstructured uh, and that require a lot of manual investigation. That's one example. Another example is in things like uh, anti-money laundering, where you know, large banks like HSBC and Citi and JP Morgan have investigative teams of anywhere from five to 10,000 people who investigate claims to figure out is there anti-money laundering potential in here or not. Lucky for us, most of their work does not result in suspicious activities, right? Mm -hmm. So in fact, the statistic is that anywhere from 80 to 90%, 98% of their work actually does not result in a suspicious activity filing. So if you think about the expense of having 10,000 people who are looking at, yeah, all right. Is this better? Oh, oh. Sounds like the voice of God now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So again, think about things like anti-money laundering, where you have anywhere from one to 10,000 people who are investigating these claims, and 80 to 90% of their work basically does not result in a filing, right? It's a lot of expense, which does not result in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in an outcome. So, and again, that's a problem where you have lots and lots of unlabeled data. You don't know most transactions are fraudulent or not, or have anti-money laundering. So being able to use intelligent applications to identify and reduce the investigative volumes, right? It's a huge problem. And it involves regulators pretty intimately because regulators are very worried about whether this is kosher or not. They don't want banks getting away with, uh, you know, with, uh, with supporting anti-money laundering. It's, that's another large set of applications. Um, 
other other sets of applications are in things like credit decisioning, where all of a sudden, since banks are now able to merge all of their data sets together, they're thinking of novel ways in which they can make credit decisions. And again, being able to justify these decisions to regulators is super critical, right? Even though I fully believe that in the in the next decade or so, a lot of these operations will be automated, but these intelligent systems still need to build trust with their human operators uh, and the regulators. Um, it's also, I think, uh, maybe a tangential point here that I want to make is, in some sense, you know, when people start talking about AI, uh, calling yourself an AI solution is a very low bar these days. So if you have a little if then in your in your code somewhere, or if you have a little predictive model somewhere, I don't think you should get a gold star for being able to achieve that. Uh, there's so much more in machine learning uh, and and in intelligent applications overall. Uh, that these banks can take advantage of. I, think I, I can go on for a very long time, but I think I'll stop here and, and we can discuss it. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, you know, I think we're we're shockingly like coming coming close on time. And given given that uh, this is Ty and a lot of folks in the the room are interested in you know what where are the opportunities for for creating new companies or launching new ideas, uh, I have like a. a, a Basically, a set of questions to the three of you. If, if you were tomorrow starting a company, uh, you know, if there is, is there a pain point that you see from all the experience that you guys have from from the, the respective vantage points you're looking at um, that you might highlight for people to go focus on, pay attention to? Would you have some tips for maybe uh, making sense of creating new companies in your space? You know, in Gurjeet, in your case, I'm curious. You know, can you can you create an interesting AI machine learning startup in the financial space without a data set? Or Roy, in your case, I, uh, you know, a lot of startup entrepreneurs are sometimes intimidated by the effect of regulation on launching a new business. How would you, how would you have them think about uh, approaching that? So maybe, Ashwin, you can kick us off. OK. I thought you were going to start there. But, no. <laughs> um, just trying to keep you guys on your toes. No, uh, uh, it's a great question. And um, I'll just, I, I, I don't have the experience of being an entrepreneur. so. Full, full respect to all of those who are trying to start and um, have started. Um, the issues that I see, uh, especially when you know we have new companies uh, coming to us and solving a problem very well, and I'll give you a very practical example. Uh, one of the things that is critical for uh, Lyft as a company is uh, paying the drivers immediately because they're strapped for cash and they need to uh, earn money quickly. And um, we have several companies who come to us solving that problem fantastically well. They've thought about that problem and they've got fantastic APIs. You know, all you need to do is just plug into it and solve it. But what they've not done is they've not thought through the entire process and the end-to-end -end problem. Because as a company utilizing those services, I just don't need to pay the driver. I need to then make sure that 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 the taxi, taxation process follows. I need to make sure there's reporting so that I can create my own operational processes behind the scene. And they haven't solved for that. So in a very simple question, how do I get reports? And they'll be like, oh yeah, we'll send it to you. And you know, it doesn't work. So my suggestion is think through the entire you know, set of requirements that a customer would need. Work, go customer backwards. Understand what they, all the aspects of it are, because if I have to go through additional steps to create more processes that drives my cost up to support this solution, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go with something more traditional that's more well established. So that's one tip I would leave, and I'll ask. Uh, that's yeah, great. To Thanks so much. Roy, what would you say about any suggestions for uh, startup entrepreneurs thinking about approaching regulation, or um, you know, should they be afraid of it? Or <laughs> well. I have to say no, of course. Um, <laughs> no, but but really, uh, well, I, I want to answer the, the question about um, where where should you be thinking about um, setting up the next company. Um, I think Asia ASEAN would be a tremendous um, market for you to think about because, first of all, it is quite relatively untapped. Um, in terms of financial services, it's quite nascent, and that's that's where um, growth will you can go ten x. 100x um, because they don't have much um, 
within the region other than maybe Singapore. Um, so using Singapore as a base, and then you can think about what can you do for Cambodia, what can you do for Laos, what can you do for Vietnam, what can you do for Myanmar. These are um, opportunities that you can tap on. And in terms of regulation, I think... Roy, can I just inject the, the add-on question there? You know, historically, when you launch a financial product in one country, it's codified in the rules, the regulation of that country, and you know, starting in another country is often starting from scratch in a way. Do you see that changing in um, the Asia market? Or? Which is the point that I'm actually going into. Um, and, and this is an area where I think um, regulators around the region is coming together to see how we can help um, the whole region grow together. And, and this year is ASEAN 50, uh, 50th anniversary, and next year Singapore is ASEAN chair. So I th th there is a lot of opportunity, and, and we recognize that. Um, in terms of regulation, what can we do to make us closer and what can we do to harmonize that a little bit more. But, but bear in mind, it's 10 different countries. Um, we will do as much as we can. And I think um, there are certain countries that we are working very closely with and that's where um, opportunities can be tapped. And in terms of regulation, I think one important um, lessons that we learned throughout the two, three years um, that we were looking at um, growing the fintech um, activity in Singapore and the region is that don't try to regulate something that you don't understand. And this is a lot of mistakes that I unfortunately some of my colleagues in other places have made. Um, trying to regulate something that they don't understand. And this is the philosophy that we took on, which is why we work on the basis of experimentation. So in, even within MES, when we look at new solutions, if we don't understand it, instead of um, writing a white paper or coming up with some rules and regulations and try to regulate that area. We want to experiment with the startup, we want to experiment with the financial institutions, whether is it through the sandbox um, or through other means. Um, and and that's, that's what we want to do. Experiment first, understand the issue, understand the area before we start putting in um, rules or regulations, or if, if, there is, isn't, if there isn't a need to regulate, don't regulate, um, because that would just stifle um, innovation to take place. In fact, um, Thai Singapore brought a delegation of startups here. One of the company called Policy Pal is part of the sandbox because they have uh, innovative ideas, but currently the whole regulatory regime doesn't allow that to happen. So we put them in a sandbox to see how we can help them to produce their product um, in, the, in the market. Roy, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in there and throw it to, to Gurdjieff for a second because I think we just have a few more minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Gurdjieff, what, what would yeah. your thoughts be? So I know we are at the very end. I'll be quick. Uh, I will add on to what, uh, what Ashwin said, right, which is end-to-end -end workflows. You know, one of the things that we realized when we were building Ayasi is that you can have the world's best machine learning and the world's best models. But unless you wrap them around in applications that end business users can use, it's basically not that useful. So, you know, we, and that's what we had to do as a company as well, is that, you know, in addition to building the general machine learning platform, we had to go and build an application framework so we could build these end-to-end -end applications that end business users could use, not just the data scientists or whatever, or just the IT people. So I think uh, I absolutely agree. I think it's super critical to focus on the complete end-to-end -end workflow for any problem that you're trying to attach with machine learning. Because unless you affect the you know, day-to-day -day business users, it's basically not that useful. Um, I will also say from a regulator's perspective, um, first of all, I'm an unpaid salesman for MAS. I think <laughs> these guys are amazing. Uh, and so I would definitely encourage you to start your fintechs in Singapore. I think they got, these guys really get it and they really help out. Uh, but I think regulators are actually helpful when they do their job correctly. You know, they, they are, there's actually many opportunities in large financial services organizations that they are not well suited to attack. You know, they end up spending hundreds of millions to billions of dollars doing these ginormous compliance projects. And there's a lot of opportunity for startups there. I would definitely go look deep. And from an engineering perspective, you know, sometimes these problems can feel a little boring. Uh, but that's good because, you know, that also deters your com competition. Um, I would also finally end my, my recommendations on, you know, if you think about the largest banks in the world, the largest retail bank in the world has 50 million customers. There are 7 billion people on the planet. So there is a huge amount of opportunity in going after, you know, the people who are not well served or, uh, or the people who, you know, who are being basically ignored by large financial services institutes. That's all fantastic points. 
Uh, I think we are probably, do we have time for one question? No, okay, we're, <laughs> we're, this is like, uh, we're being booed off stage, but I wanna uh, extend another warm thanks to all of our panelists, because this was uh, fantastic and very insightful. Appreciate it.